Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, doing another movie review this week. This time, it's a teen comedy that came out on March 31st, 1999. What do you know? 20th anniversary. <laughs> and it's called, 10 Things I Hate About You. Yep, a modern take on William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew. <laughs> but done exactly in a high school style <laughs> okay yeah this is the blu-ray release uh, that came out from Disney or Touchstone Home Entertainment that was at the time celebrating its 10th anniversary edition but the blu-ray came out a little late uh, 2010 because the movie came out in 1999 and if this was celebrating its 10th anniversary it would have been released in 2009 so yeah <sighs> smart move there Disney um, but this release does have an HD print so solid transfer actually looks a lot better than the previous DVD which I never owned but it does have um, a featurette just 35 minutes of uh, the cast and crew mostly archive footages but the rest were all filmed at the time that were brand new in um, sometime in 2010 or 2009 so they explained about what happened 10 years later <laughs> that's on the back right here and so there's something misleading here because there was no deleted scenes uh, section that's supposed to be released separately so apparently you only get the deleted scenes on the featurette and I'm like damn it Disney you totally blew it again <laughs> you could have just put all the features as a separate uh, feature so that way we get to see something that's missing I'm pretty certain they would have had a lot of them in the vault so they <laughs> they still didn't get it right uh, but it does have the commentary of some of the cast and crew um, we're behind the movie so there you go but this movie um, had the rising star of sad to say the late great uh, Heath Ledger just had a birthday yesterday he would have been 40 years old today think about it if he was still alive today you know I think he would have appreciated it because um, he had a fun time working on this movie hoping that this was going to be a feature ahead of him plus he was actually in a TV show in Australia which aired in North America on Nickelodeon called Ship to Shore this is where he got a start I think uh, before he wants to do this movie so this was his first film you got Julia Stiles and I think this is one of her earlier films if you think about it but this was her rising star too and not only that, but you also have Justin Gordon-Levitt, uh, Fur Rock from the Sun, the TV show with John Lithgow, uh, along with French Stewart and Chrisanna Johnson, yeah. which is a long-running series um, that aired on NBC. Of course, Justin Gordon-Levitt was in the movie Angels in the Outfield, but he was also doing some commercials for a while. But still, um, he was actually... This is one of his breakthrough roles, too. Also, Larissa Okinick from The Secret World of Alex Mack, which I know her first film was uh, a drama called uh, Intersection, with Richard Gere, Sharon Stone, Levita Davidovich, and Martin Landau. Yeah, it wasn't that good. But we did know that she was um, the star of the film, playing the daughter. She also went on to do the film The Babysitter's Club. Keep that in mind. Um, also, she did appear on the show Fur Rock from the Sun with Joseph Gordon Levitt, so that seems like what are the odds here? <laughs> Plus, we got David Krumholtz from The Santa Claus and Adam's Family Values. He's been in several movies and has done uh, TV shows as well. Uh, he's very good. In fact, he stole the show <laughs> in this movie. Uh, 
Andrew Keegan, um, who's also a good actor. I think he went on to do films like O, also with Julia Stiles too, which is another take on Shakespeare. Uh, the Broken Hearts Club, and he was also in the TV show Party of Five and Seven Heaven, come to mind. So I, I definitely recognize him. Um, Larry Miller, the, the comedian from, um, who was on Seinfeld. He's a stand-up comedian, but he has done a lot of movies. Uh, he also went on to do the voice of, um, of the robot um, from the TV show Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. Susan Mae Pratt, um, she's been in several teen flicks, uh, such as Drive Me Crazy, yeah, with Marissa Joan Hart, and Clarissa Experience It All, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Did not care for that movie. It's, it's a pretty forgettable flick. Um, but it did have that theme song by ugh, Britney Spears. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know, I know. But she also did the movie Center Stage, which is a way better film, and I love that movie too. <laughs> Hell, you even got um, Allison Jenny. Yes, you got Allison Jenny, who went on to do films like Juno and Spy. She even did that TV show called Mom. <laughs> and even David, uh, even uh, David Leisure from uh, the TV show Empty Nest, but he also did those Azuzu commercials. It's great to see him in this. And even uh, Daryl Chili Mitchell, who went on to do uh, Galaxy Quest, as well as uh, Straight Outta Compton. Same actor. It's very good. Wow, what a cast. <laughs> All by um, director uh, Gil Junger, who's uh, best known for doing uh, directing TV shows. Um, he also worked on, I think, uh, photography and cinematography and stuff. So he's also working behind camera as well with Mark Irwin. Uh, and um, which was also his first film too. His first uh, directorial debut with um, writers um, Karen McCollan and Kirsten Smith. Yeah, both of them. Um, they went on to write um, Legally Blonde and Ella Enchanted. So, great writers. So, yeah, this, this is a pretty smart, witty script. Um, that sure uh, got away with everything. I mean, this was at the time when we were getting so many teen flicks, and they they definitely got away with uh, they definitely got away with it with all this adult humor, you know, foul language and some sexual situations, uh, a windu and all that in the mix of the movies. Um, and this is a PG-13 flick. But it would have been an R-rated film, but surprisingly, it was pretty tame. So, because I guess, well, maybe they wanted it that way. Also, to note though that uh, for its 20th anniversary, there was a screening that happened earlier, and my friend Brendan Mitchell, aka Wet Movie One, actually attended there. Because it was also an autism event too, so they joined in for the screening. And some of the the cast, not all of them though, just some of the cast and crew had attended there for the screening. And I can't believe it. Um, he actually got to meet the actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt. As well as Louisa Okineck, the director, Gil Junger. I think a few, even Andrew Keegan. So, Oh, he was so lucky. Uh, I wish I had attended there at the time, but by the time that happened, it was too late. Plus, I had to go to my cousin's birthday, so that's true. Um, I'm mostly busy with the family, so I never have time. And also with school and everything. And also, by that time, I, I just went to go see Alita Battle Angel <laughs> in theaters. So I was lucky to see that afterwards. So that's why I didn't Tim, but nevertheless. <laughs>
I still love this movie even after 20 years. And oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you the Blu-ray, what it really looks like, right here. <laughs> I really miss artworks these days uh, for Blu-rays because nowadays they're just using different colors. I guess they wanted to save some time. There was a TV series uh, that was very short-lived. It aired on ABC Family, which is now Freeform. I never saw it, so I can't say, but I did heard that Larry Miller uh, reprised his role as the fodder in the movie. And I guess you could say it only lasted 20 episodes, and I think Gil Junger directed some of them. Part of it was the producer. Um... I guess it just didn't help. And they were going to be a follow-up uh, to that called Ten Things I Hate About Life with, with Eva Rachel Wood uh, playing the role. Unfortunately, um, it was unfinished. They did film the movie. Um, there's even a trailer that they posted on YouTube to see some of the clips here and there. But it never happened. They they canceled the film due to budget constraints and all that, and also the fact that it deals with uh, uh, Evan Rachel Woods' pregnancy that was going around. And I think that's probably why she left for in, during the project because they had to stop shooting. So in order for her to um, have the baby, they got to find a way to. You know, take some time before she'll be able to start shooting all of her scenes again. But then they were pulled through, and and even worse, she got sued by the producers, uh, but not demanding much money. And I think that was a shame. But either way, I probably wouldn't like both of them anyway. I mean, let's face it, you can't replace the original cast. The movie was already good as it is, and we don't need follow-ups. Okay, this is not MASH, when you can actually take a, a very um, funny comedy and just turn it into a long-running TV series that, that's so smart, witty, filled with drama at times. Yeah, they had dramatic moments and all of that in place. And you got a great cast joining in. Um, almost topping the, the original cast. So, I guess sometimes, you know, a TV series based on a movie can work, or other times they can't. So, that's a fine example of that. Let, let's get to the review. It stars um, Julia Stiles, Heath Ledger, uh, Louisa Okinick, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Andrew Keegan, David Krumholtz, Susan Mae Pratt, Gabriel Union, yes, Gabriel Union from Bring It On, that follows afterwards, and several other movies she's been doing. Uh, Larry Miller, uh, Daryl Mitchell, Allison Jenny, David Leisure, uh, Ray Jackson, Kyle Cease, which also features... Um, the bands of uh, both uh, Letters to Cleo, yeah, that's that's led by Kate Hanley, um, with guitarist uh, Greg McKenna, uh, Michael Eisenstein, the bassist uh, Scott uh, Weinbing, and drummer Jason Sutter. Sutter, sorry. Uh, they also have Safe Ferris, the joint, yes, named after, I, I think, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, because remember that, uh, <laughs> or that movie? Uh, which had uh, the lead singer Monique Powell, along with guitarist um, Brian Mashburn. Bassist is um, Bill Uchik, um, Uchi, I don't, I can't say it right. Uh, trumpet. The trumpeter is um, Jose um, Cazanos. Uh, Trebonus is Brian Williams. The saxophonist is Eric Samora. And drummer is Evan uh, Kerborn. So, so they're there. 
Um, it's written by, once again, Karen McCullen and Karen Smith, and it's directed by Gil Junger. The movie begins set in Seattle, Washington, at a local high school called Padua, which is definitely like the tallest uh, fairy tale like castle that they ever got, where the king, queen, the prince, and the princesses would live <laughs> all the way, with all the rest of the crew. Um, but it does give it a Shakespearean feel to it. They actually shot this three weeks with all the, the unique styles. And right at the corner, you see the, the football stadium right there. And it looks really cool. That's right underneath here. <laughs> well, anyway, um, we meet a new student named Cameron James, who's played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who becomes instantly smitten with a popular sophomore named Bianca Stratford, who's played by Louis Okinek. We meet um, a geeky type of character who actually steals the show, by the way, named Michael Ekman, played by David Krumholtz, who warns him that Bianca is vavid and conceive that her overprotective father, named Walter, played by Larry Miller, does not allow Bianca nor her, her older sister, Kat, or Katharina, played by Julia Stiles, who's the shrew, She's actually a senior to accept at Sarah Lawrence uh, College in New York, but warns her to stay close to home. Bianca wishes to date by a senior who turns out to be a complete asshole, and you're going to love this. His name is Joey Donner. Yes, I never thought we would get an unlikable prick under... A nickname that I have <laughs> because my nickname is Joey but they do call me Joe and well they call me Joey Bowie whatever. but of course my name is Joseph yeah but don't worry you know I, don't, I you know <laughs> my name is everywhere so I'm not complaining anyway uh, he's played by Andrew Keegan um, so, here's another problem, too, was Walter worries about um, teen pregnancy that's about to happen to one of her daughters. Also to note that uh, his wife left. Yeah, I think they went divorce. Doesn't explain, but you get it. So, he would not allow his daughters to date until they graduate. But frustrated by Bianca's assistance, and Kat's rebellious that Walter declares that Bianca may date only if Kat does. Because of her antisocial attitude that Kat has, that this is going to be a lot tougher and complicated as it seems. And it really is. And that's where we're going to lead to the story here. Because that's when Cameron tries to act... Uh, Bianca out, only to inform her that under her father's uh, new rule, that as a pretense to allow her to date Joey, but she actually suggested that Cameron will find someone else to actually date Kat. And that's where we meet um, a bad boy named Patrick Barona, who's played by Heath Ledger. But, of course, <laughs> um, Patrick actually scares both of them out. But that actually led to Michael assisting uh, Joey to actually pay Patrick to take Cat out. And yeah, this is where Joey was like drawing a, <laughs> a picture of a girl's boobs on the cafeteria tray. And then once up uh, drawing uh, <laughs> Michael's... Uh, face with with a penis so yeah he has a dick on his face <laughs> okay well anyway he offered to pay uh, Patrick to take Kat out under the pretense that this will allow Joey to to date uh, Bianca so Patrick agrees to, to the deal but then Kat rebuffs um, for her first few events and Michael and Cameron t tends to help him out by prying Bianca for information on what 
cat likes and dislikes. Yeah, so they had to write down a list to do so. Um, but with that knowledge alone, Patches suddenly begins to date cats, which they didn't get along at first, but as far as this connection concerns, once they went to a local bar, they decided to go out, hoping that this will be um, the best request they can take. She does go to a party with him, which enables uh, Bianca to go well, much to Walter's dismay. Um, and this is where they went to a an actual huge party uh, inside um, at the the guy who owns the the house. It was like a huge party, you know. Go, everyone was like fighting, you know. Everyone's getting drunk, you know, drinking all that beer. They're all making out, you know, having the best time of their lives. And of course, you know, dancing to party music, you know, like a mix of of seventies, eighties, and bit of 90s uh, music right there. <laughs> so, then Kat suddenly becomes very upset when she sees Bianca with Joey. And then she decided to get drunk, and this is where she starts, you know, dancing until she passes out, you know, with uh, <laughs> Patrick uh, coming in to, to help her. And that's when they went outside and they made a conversation uh, trying to, um, by actually going straight to the swings and trying to make her feel better, but you know, trying to tell her to look straight in, in his eyes, and but then she vomits and all that. It's, so at that point on, as things were not working out, Patrick and Kat decided to, to go straight home, drive her along, and they were going to kiss, you know, just make conversation, but he decided to... Uh, not right now, you know, just just wait a little. Um, it wasn't working well for um, both um, Bianca and and Cameron, so because uh, even Joey uh, decided to go with um, um, Bianca's friend named Chastity, you know, played by uh, Gabriel Union. Now she decided to go with, with Joey, and then that's, you know, they leave together. Now it's, now Cameron and Bianca decide to to leave. They drive, they drive off, and, and this is when they make a conversation. Now, um, Bianca actually kiss Cameron, so, and the game is on. <laughs> I know. Okay, oh, Joey offers to pay Patrick to take Kat to the prom, so that way he can take Bianca. But of course, as far as that's concerned, Cameron decided to join in and decided to take her to the prom. Well, yeah, that was that'll be later on. But then Patrick initially refuses, but he relents uh, Joey to have more money to make out. But since Kat is uh, still angry with Patrick, I mean, they decided to make it up. And this is one of the most memorable scenes of them all, and definitely the best scene, was when... <laughs> Patrick decided to bribe um, the marching band, and this is where he was about to sing the song by Frankie Bally called Can't Take My Eyes Off of You, <laughs> right into the bleachers. Yeah, he takes the the microphone and they stole it over there, and then and just sings the song directly straight to uh, the cat, and and cat suddenly loves it, and he was like dancing along, you know, uh, singing with the microphone and just having fun until the two guards uh, started to chase him down, and he got caught, and he wants up in detention, so in order to Cat to get him off of the tension. She decided to actually <laughs> to go after the teacher, who was played by uh, David Leisure, by the way. It, yeah, he plays um, Mr. Chapman, uh, actually the coach of the girls' soccer team, um, which uh, <laughs> the girls were just shooting arrows, and and and, and Bianca ac accidentally shot an arrow that went straight into his butt. <laughs> 
just when uh, uh, Joey came and tried to, um, you know, just to flirt with Bianca. Uh, of course, we all know that Joey is a model, so he also likes to show Bianca uh, about his modeling skills. I mean, through the the photos that he has. I mean, like this one where he wears a black shirt, and uh, and another one where he wears a white shirt, and he has a she has to choose. Okay. Well, anyway, um, Kat decided to distract him just by having the, um, Patrick escape from detention. And yes, this is where she lifts up uh, her brows <laughs> right in front of the entire students. So, <laughs> um, yeah, just to show her boobs. You don't see it in in the movie, but of course, because it's PG-14, everything has to be cut down. But there you go; it made it up for it. So then now they decided to go out, you know, have fun, just rolling around the boats, and then suddenly playing uh, paintballs. Yeah, just throwing all these paintballs around and just having fun. But then he was explaining um, to a cat that he wants to take her out to a plum and. She kind of refuses, and then she's like saying about the conversation that's going around, and it's telling them about why you're doing this. I mean, did someone ask you to to say this? But no, he's he's just he's just telling them that no, I just want to do this. And but with her attitude, I mean, she decided that well, you might need therapy for this. But so what well, could have been a nice. Um, afternoon just turn out that well just being angry again and that's when uh, both Bianca and Kat decide to talk it out of it and try to fix this problem until finally everything gets solved because Bianca definitely wants to go out you know she wants to have fun she wants to be able to date um, the guy she really wants to go out with but at this point on <laughs> It was Cameron who wanted to uh, go out with Bianca, so that worked out pretty well. At the end, once uh, he came over to their door, and then they took her out. But of course, Cat also decided to leave, uh, going to the prom. So all alone, so things are going so well as it seems. Um, you know, you actually have the band Safe Ferris uh, singing, uh, joining in with me, "Letters to Cleo," and. And this is where, I guess, <laughs> uh, Patrick actually offered um, the singer to actually go s straight to um, <laughs> to the crowd uh, right in front of them to sing the song "Cruel to Be Kind." Yeah, that was a that was a song that was by um, um, by Nick Lowe. Yeah. So this was like a cover version that Letters to Cleo sing. Even though they join in with Steve Ferris. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, it was going pretty well until suddenly uh, Joey came along. Because he didn't get picked up. Um, but he didn't pick up Bianca since he already left and Walter closed the door on him. And this is where it led to a fight. Because... Yeah, he even told uh, Patrick that that he had to, that he actually paid her for this. But the real truth uh, brings out that yes, this is the unbelievable truth that uh, he didn't um, he didn't really pay her to to go out. It turns out that well, <laughs> yes, he did want to be with her, and, but then uh, Joey also punches uh, Cameron. And this is where Bianca came and punches him back. <sighs> punches him in the nose and kicks him in the nuts and everything. Because of what he did. Because he was an asshole anyway. And he got what he deserved at the end. After what they found out. So. Well, I guess for a while, you know, the prom was okay. But then it just... Both... Uh, Cat and, and Patrick, you know, they decided to they decided not to see each other for a while. So they left. 
sadly. But she left first. And, you know. So, by the next day, Bianca decided to re reconcile with Kat and begins dating with Cameron from now on. Walter admits that Kat is capable of taking care of herself, but gives permission to attend Sarah Lawrence uh, College. But then she had to do an assignment um, at school, you know, because they do Shakespeare. I mean, that's where you got Daryl Mitchell, you know, as a teacher, just having fun, just rapping and <laughs> with the mix of Shakespeare. Uh, this is where they required to write their own version of Sonnet uh, 141 by William Shakespeare. And this is where Cap uh, read a poem, which is, of course, the title of the movie, Ten Fiends I Hate About You. And, yeah, pretty sad uh, scene. But she knew that she loved Patrick. And to make it up for it, Patrick actually surprised her with a Fender guitar. And they fell in love, and there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm spoiling it, but that's okay. Um, it, it's still fun. I love this movie. Um, definitely, um, definitely a hilarious teen comedy ever made. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, the right tone, the perfect location, a lot of witty dialogue, uh, Amazing soundtrack uh, from both uh, Letters to Cleo and and Say Ferris, as well as all the all all these random '90s songs and as well as '70s and '80s, yeah, that you can think of. Um, of course, uh, at the end of the movie, um, you got Letters to Cleo. Actually, the, the entire band are actually on top of the roof of um, Padua High School yeah, Stadium during the end credits. Um, which actually they sing the song, I Want You to Want Me, which, of course, was originally performed by Cheap Trick. Yeah. I mean, no one could top the original, no doubt about it. Um, I always loved that song. Um, anyway, uh, great cast right there. Um, there's even moments uh, when Michael Ekman, who stole the show in the movie, <laughs> was trying to make out with uh, Mandela, who was played by Susan May. Pratt, who um, was also into um, William Shakespeare, so t to actually uh, attended her to for the palm so they can date and have the best time of their lives. And they I actually dresses up like um, one of the Shakespeare plays, yeah, like Mac Macbeth and all those ones. Yeah. So that was nice. Um, a lot, lot of uh, funny scenes here and there. I mean, no doubt about it. Uh, and, you know, it was, I, I had to say, you know, the rest of the cast really made it up for it. I, I love um, Justin Gordon Levin in the film. Definitely have terrific chemistry with Louis Okinick. And, quite honestly, I mean, they, they were meant for each other more than, than Andrew Keegan with with Oki Nick, but nevertheless, uh, you know, Andrew Keegan was also very good too, playing an obnoxious jerk, and an asshole too, but still, um, but um, the fact that you got Heath Ledger, yeah, God rest his soul, with uh, Julia Stiles together, just is an icing on the cake, I mean, think about it, I mean, both of them are, are socially alike in that sort of way because they're both, you know, they're both tough, um, bad boys, bad girls type. I mean, they're always, they're always acting this way, you know. So that's just the whole point of Taming of the Shrew. So once they're together, they, they tame them and now they, they end up falling in love, even though it's, it's tough love <laughs> in a way. Um, but they work together as a they they definitely work together. Um I was a Jenny though, I you know, I, I wish she had more scenes though, but it was really interesting to see her, you know, just playing a uh, a guidance counselor named Miss Perky. 
So where she's just spending her time, you know, just just writing a story uh, through her laptop. Yeah, it was an Apple laptop. Um, it was it was really nice to see her too. I mean, consider. I mean, this is way before she became this popular. <laughs> Um, <laughs> especially the scene where she just takes out uh, a coffee mug of a, uh, a picture of a cat <laughs> and then tells to the cat um, there's actually a moment uh, at the end of the movie uh, as the credits uh, finishes or still rolling um, where both um, Julia Stiles and Louisa Okinek uh, it's, it was part of the outtakes um, where suddenly, um, yeah, Alison Jenny suddenly makes love with Gil Junger, <laughs> the director of the film. Which, by the way, Gil Junger actually uh, actually appears as a teacher in the movie too. Uh, some of his scenes were cut, though, sadly. Um, again, I wish there were more. And there's even more scenes where you know Miss Perky, you know, Alison Jenny just started making love with David Leisure. <laughs> Mr. Chapman, and then, <laughs> I mean, even during the prom scenes, and, wow, that was really funny. I was like, wow, I, I wish there were more scenes with these guys, because they were the best part, too. <laughs> yeah, and, and Daryl, uh, yes, Daryl Mitchell, uh, he really also stole the show, too, playing the, the teacher of... Of English class, and he, he was like having fun, you know, just rapping, and <laughs> and he's like <laughs> very smooth, and he's and and he's actually fast talking too. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, geez, this is the kind of teen comedy that we really need nowadays. And I mean, Mean, mean Girls was another one too that follows the same footsteps, uh, but. Still, I mean, even in the late 90s, I mean, this was perfect. I'm glad they had this. Because the way they advertised this movie uh, through the billboards and everything at the time, I mean, they, they didn't even know what it was. Even Disney wanted to change the title to whatever title they want to choose, but because it was an offbeat title, uh, 10 Things I Hate About You. Um, I wish the Blu-ray actually had uh, trailers and TV spots because they had tons of them too. A lot of marketing this movie went for. And I'm glad to see that the movie was a, a modest hit. It was at number two at the box office. It came out at the same time as, you're going to love this, The Matrix. Because that film was huge already. So two films were doing so well. Um, and I'm glad. Uh, this was a very popular film. Love the cast again. Love the music, um, including the two bands, Letters to Cleo and Say Ferris. Uh, I love the the Shakespeare reference to it. It really works. And I love the location, um, Tacoma, Washington, which is Seattle, Washington, part of it, with this lovely. Um, <laughs> the lovely high school that they had and, and all the funny scenes and moments here and there <laughs> yeah so anyway that's 10 things I hate about you and I give it 5 stars I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later bye